Okay, very good morning, folks. It is Wednesday, the 3rd of March. So going to give you the regular market briefing for today, recapping where we finished on Wall Street, some highlights from overnight in Asia, where we had some quite soft um, Chinese data in the form of the service PMI number. Irrespective of that, though, the Asian market mood generally lifted, reversing what we had was a lower close on Wall Street, where once again, the tech sector was an underperformer. Um, companies like Apple and Tesla were down around 2 and 4% respectively, weighing on the technology uh, sector index within the S&P. Um, but the, the general lift in, in sentiment going into European open from Asia's handover sees then equity index futures a little bit more positive. Uh, DAX up about 50 points, NASDAQ up 85, S&P up 17 and a quarter at the moment. Uh, elsewhere, T-notes very quiet in the overnight session. Uh, gold relatively flat, just a loss of three bucks at 17.30 comes with a largely unchanged dollar index to get things going this morning in the FX market, which again reflects relatively quiet trade here at the open. And then in the oil market, I can update you with the API inventories obviously impacted from the great freeze we had just a week or so ago in North America and how that's impacted that data. But as you can see from the underlying price of of crude, it hasn't really reacted too much because of that one-off um, factor. So yeah, overall this morning then, I'm not going to focus too much on the charts, going to look more so at the news because there's quite a few things to update you on. Uh, and going to start off with the general sentiment, I think, it's an important conversation, what we've had for this week so far. Uh, and a couple of conversations I've had with a couple of uh, more inexperienced traders. And it's that ability to be able to react to the current market conditions. I think often it's a little bit difficult if you haven't really accumulated the screen time to adapt and change and understand then that the variables are different. The market price across different instruments has moved and is now reflecting then a lot of what was creating over the past two weeks in the yield market. Uh, a lot of this kind of reopening trade idea and then consequent inflation and, and so on and so forth. And one of the interesting things we've seen really is this is looking at US 10 year yield over the last two and a half weeks. And as you can see, going back from the 15th all the way up to the end of last week, we saw an acceleration in US yields from around one sub 1.2 all the way up to a peak of around 1.54. This week, though, this is the price that we've traded. Uh, we've basically been locked between 1.4 and 1.44 or 1.45. So comparatively, then, we are just consolidating following what, we, what we've seen, which is this yield acceleration story, which obviously was the trigger point for a lot of the market. Sensitivity and, and negativity, if you're looking at the prices of equities or, or gold and some of the precious metals, uh, from last week. So since then, some of those products just mentioned have been putting in a continued recovery. Now, um, as we were looking at with the um, longer dated picture on US 10s on the yields is that we accelerated so quickly over that short period of the last fortnight. Where we're at at the moment is technically quite interesting as we were discussing yesterday at the lower um, end of that range that we were trading through 2019 and as we were kind of um, saying on Monday it's kind of a bit of a make or break moment now is it fair pricing for all things being equal that we've run up this quick and 1.45 kind of about reflects the current narrative uh, or did we would we break and then see a further push out and at the moment uh, the market seems content just to hold and consolidate for the time being and that is helping assist then some of the general market stability that we're seeing at the moment. Of course, things can change and there's plenty of catalysts coming up in US data from today going further forward into the rest of the week we need to keep an eye on. Uh, but I think that's quite a telling sign. And if we look at things like just briefly the US 10 year here, you can see you know after we had really uh, significant downside pressure in T notes going into Thursday last week, you can see a large portion of that move has been taken back and we're trading almost two points off the initial lows that were seen during that kind of momentum when it all capitulated at the time. Um, on the daily chart on the 10 year, it's also looking uh, fairly interesting. There was that area around 134.15, 
which marks then support areas in uh, beginning and end of March of 2020, when we were in the middle of the global kind of volatility on the initial onset of the pandemic. And we are back above that level after a brief hesitation that we saw at the beginning of the week. Um, so that technically, I'd say, is a little bit more bullish for price to hold at those levels as well. Um, just going to have a look then at some of the stories in play. Um, I said overnight, generally, the the mood a little bit more optimistic than perhaps the, the close on Wall Street would have suggested in Asia. And it came irrespective of the fact that we did have some weak Chinese data. So the positivity was generally emanating from the fact that uh, domestic press in China um, were citing analysts who suggest that the People's Bank of China could reduce the reserve requirement ratio for certain banks uh, this month was seen as a supporting factor. Um, but the gains overall tempered then by the, the fact that Chinese service sector activity grew at its slowest pace in 10 months in February. Firms struggled with sluggish demand and high costs, according to the Keijin uh, report, prompting them to cut jobs. The employment subcomponent was actually in contraction at minus 47 um, or at 47.9. Um, so overall China, I think if you're looking at that region at the moment, um, going into the European Open, China really is the focal point or at least has been in recent weeks. Um, and in the overnight session, uh, China was an outperformer gains, generally speaking, are up at around 1.5 percent um, outperforming the rest of the, the region at the moment. So people look willing to look beyond the service figure. For now, I guess it's still an expansionary territory fairly comfortably, um, irrespective of the job component, which is a little bit more worrying. Uh, and obviously, China generally, the, the emphasis is on the manufacturing side. The other thing we've had that's helped restore a little bit of calm is just further reiteration from uh, senior voters on the Federal Open Market Committee, the FMC. So Fed's Brainard spoke last night and she said that it will take, quote, some time to meet conditions for economic progress laid out by the U.S. Central Bank for reducing the pace of its massive asset purchase program. Separately, Mary Daly, also a voter, voter said our most important virtue will be patience. We are not going to react at the first hint that inflation might have breached the Fed's 2% goal. So, you know, it's just so interesting. It's kind of like what Piers and I were talking about, commenting on in the Market Watch podcast that we put out on Friday. Um, if you haven't yet uh, had a look at that, just check it out on Apple or Spotify, Market Watch uh, by Amplify Live. And we were talking about this idea of just look, letting the market have its kind of mini tantrums as what we were seeing kind of to a certain degree last week, but just hold the line uh, and unless things get exponentially worse, where you have to react, the market generally will will restore some degree of calm, or at least that's the hope. And it's much better to let the market work these things out rather than being interventionist and looking to come in and soothe market concerns with every comment, because that ultimately leads you down a very um, negative loop path where the market will be looking for some kind of confirmation on every twist and turn that we see on a daily basis. And that's definitely not the route the Fed want to go down. So at the moment, the Fed continue to kind of bang the drum of, look, we're a long way from doing anything at this point. Uh, and that, that reaffirmation, if you like, I think is quite an important component at the moment. The other thing that's, that's actually quite positive, uh, a story that came out in the FT late last night was that the Biden stimulus um, or excuse me, the Biden and U.S. plan on the coronavirus side, um, the U.S. should be in line to have enough doses of the vaccine for every adult by the end of May, according to Biden. This comes after a pretty unprecedented move where Merck um, will manufacture doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. So they're going to work in combination with one another. And actually that date of May for context would be about two months earlier than previously planned in order for the US to hit every adult. So as as Biden's intentions were when he came in looking to accelerate the vaccination program, you know, this definitely is one of those more 
you know, thankfully positive stories that, that are happening at the moment with COVID-19 generally decreasing on a nationwide level, at least um, fairly rapidly at the moment in the United States. On the stimulus front, um, I think this is still worth keeping a half an eye on. So it is due to arrive in the Senate, obviously having received passage in the House at the weekend. Um, and having failed to secure any support, though, so far from Republican lawmakers, the White House then, uh, very much Biden yesterday was on apparently on lots of different phone calls looking to uh, kind of unify Democratic Party support, because even a single defection from within the ranks of the upper chamber of Congress could well then sink the bill's chances of going through, given how fine the margins are, of course, in the Senate, where it's effectively 50-50, and VP Kamala Harris has then the deciding uh, vote. So although um, we have seen the likes of the uh, Republicans push back against things like the minimum wage increase, which, um, which has been talked about quite a lot, I still think the passage of this bill uh, looks somewhat inevitable. But any delay, I guess probably more likely, or worse, disruption that could um, severely reshape it or see it not go through at all, low probability of course, um, I think could have quite a meaningful impact on markets if that low probability scenario played out because the markets have effectively fully priced in this 1.9 trillion uh, at this point. So I, d I definitely think it's worth keeping an eye. Uh, I think the Senate are going to be meeting today and, and obviously this will probably run on through the rest of this week. Be interested to see where how the land lies by the time we get to the end of the week. We then had the oil infantry numbers last night and actually, you know, it's, it's, qu it's quite an important thing here for the context because the numbers are pretty whopping. Um, actually, uh, they're missing a, a decimal point here. So um, the actual crude build was 7.35 million Gasoline was a draw of 9.993 million, the biggest draw ever. And distillates the biggest draw since Jan 2003. Um, but as it suggests here, don't forget that this is the first data set on the weekly infantries and the API where we get to see the impact and aftermath of the, the, the freeze that we saw across the US, in particular emphasis in Texas. So huge product draws suggest demand, but with refineries that were largely shut in, and remember Texas as a state was hard hit. Uh, infantries were crushed to meet what demand there was elsewhere um, so yeah I don't I don't think the market's really assigning a great deal of priority to this despite the um, the large numbers that we've seen contained within this report from from an oil point of view obviously a lot of the attention being saturated this week on the o upcoming OPEC meeting according to Bloomberg there's widespread view that the group uh, that the market can absorb additional barrels, according to people familiar with the, de with the deliberations. And that could put the group on track to implement the majority of the 1.5 million barrel per day output increase that's up for debate on Thursday. So that's the million Saudi putting back on, plus the 500k from OPEC. Um, just 24 hours or so now into the official meeting. So uh, as I always say, you're probably going to see rumours and leaks start to intensify on the likes of various... Uh, press publications and Twitter and so on. So worth just keeping an eye out. The reference point, the bar is set at 1.5 million. So uh, if you were judging any type of immediate intraday market movement on any of this um, rumor mongering, then really it's about how close is it to that 1.5? I would say that's very much the expectation. So anything away from that, um, higher or lower is what we'd be looking for for any um, a greater degree of price impact in the short term. Then you've got the UK budget that's coming out 12.30 later on today. Um, for any new traders, the budget is a bit of a funny one because it generates obviously a lot of media interest. It is generally something that the public, the general public are interested in because it has meaningful impact on people's lives day to day. Uh, but from a, from a market's point of view, very rarely is it um, that important beyond very nuanced moves within perhaps individual equity subsectors. Um, and when I talk about that, you know, things like the extension of stamp uh, holiday on stamp duty has already boosted some of the home builder stocks. 
um, estate agents, property websites like Rightmove, people like that have had a benefit on the back of that, um, that expectation that's already really baked in. Further assisted by the government's plan to bring back things like 95% mortgages, something they moved away from, just giving how more high risk they are, of course, um, in the back and the wake of some of the other financial ter- market turbulence we've had in the past. Um, so that's helped home builders. UK retail and pub stocks have already been up this week on the idea that the government is going to provide grants to nearly 700,000 businesses. Um, and we heard last night that Sunak is expected to uh, extend the furlough scheme through till the end of September, paying 80% of wages for those in the programme through to the end of June and then tailing that down for the final three months. So when it comes to things like the budget, it's very well telegraphed. As I've just said, if you were just looking at home builders uh, or retail and pub related stocks in the, in, in the UK, for example, they've already been pre-positioning. The, the confirmation is inevitable here. Um, it's, it's, it's always a very um, leaked event where the Chancellor will be speaking because he'll be wanting to uh, I guess it's kind of damage control. If he is going to do anything, he just wants to kind of do the media rounds, get the market prepared. So when he actually comes out, nothing's a real big surprise, particularly if he needs to talk about things like tax, for example. Um, one of the big things on that issue of tax, the bigger deal perhaps to the domestic equity market would be a move to increase the rate of corporation tax. Um, and on that point, Although, according to Goldman Sachs, this isn't likely until life returns to some form of normality. Uh, They did say that bumping the tax up on companies by six percentage points, which is what's been muted by the likes of the Sunday Times, I think it was at the weekend, to 25% to bring it in line with other countries could spark a fall in UK stocks and shave off around 4% from the blue chip FTSE 100 stock index market capitalisation. So... Again, I think Goldman's are right though. I think there's a step approach to how the the government want to to deal with tax implications of paying for the phenomenal amount of government spending that's happening to support much needed companies on the reopening of this economy over the course of the next few months. So I think perhaps that's a, a thing for later on down the line, but I think that is coming as quite an interesting speed bump in time when you know you kind of have this delicious meal and then all of a sudden this big fat bill lands on your, your table and you're like oof okay yeah we can pay that but it's going to be painful um, but I think that's an issue for later not for now so for the moment I think you know all in summary as much as the budget is going to really dominate the news today especially this afternoon in the mainstream media I would say for the pound the vaccination story is so much more important uh, if we're looking at the kind of short to medium term horizon i.e. from really now out into the next three months at least that's much more definitive than than I'd say this is at this point in time Um, just having a look then and wrapping things up at the day what else have we got to to look forward to so you do have the various different eurozone and UK Um, service PMI numbers but these are final readings as you can clearly see here so they're not expected to be market moving so moving us on through the budget then into the US session we do get ADP Um, this often looked at as the precursor of course for the jobs report which we'll get on Friday in NFP so look out for that at 115 and that will be alongside the US ISM services PMI we'll get at 3 o'clock the ISM services PMI at 60 could be quite interesting that would actually bump us back up to the highest levels we've been since really late of 2018 it does come on the uh, after that particularly strong three-year high we saw in the manufacturing reading on monday um, so probably looking out for similar strength there and then you've got the doe all inventories at 3 30 at the usual time which might create a little bit of interest just giving the outline nature of some of the numbers that we had in the apis last night but as i said I wouldn't be looking for any long-lasting impact from that, even with big figures, given the fact that there is an explainable situation for that occurrence and the close proximity of the OPEC meeting, which is ultimately, I think, a bigger uh, bigger story for price at the moment. Then, from a speaker's perspective, very much concentrated in the afternoon. So things really kick off at 
um, at one o'clock with ECB's Panetta. But you've got ECB speaker um, Panetta and De Guindos at one and three. You've got Bank of England's Tenreiro, who is speaking about negative interest rates. And you'll remember she was one of the most vocal proponents of negative rates a few months ago when it looked like a more viable tool that the UK could look to move to. That's been completely priced off the table now. Interested to see what she has to say. She's speaking at four. Then you've got Fed voting members, both Bostick and Evans, speaking at five and six o'clock um, late afternoon. So definitely quite a bumper speaker schedule to be aware of as well. Uh, but that's it. So going to leave it there for the briefing. Going to wish you guys a good day. If you're a part of the Amplify Live community, and I've got a brand new masterclass which we recorded with one of Australia's biggest bond traders uh, for many years, Mark Gardner. He joined us on a call and it's been recorded. They're going to share that with the community at 6 p.m. London time tonight. He's got some really fascinating kind of insight to his his 20 odd year career. And he talks about his biggest loss in a really open and honest way. And it's a it's a pretty whopping loss. Um, and But he's really honest about how that happened and lessons learned from that and practical ways that he's implemented since then to develop that kind of um, mental procedure to ensure that type of thing doesn't happen again. And he talks about trading the Asia Pack session. So some really great um, intel there for, for traders new and old. So I'll leave it at that. Let you guys crack on with the day. Any questions at all, just let me know in the Discord room or on the video if you're watching this later on, on YouTube. Take care.